So I'd like to kind of set this story, blending two important parasites, which you've heard from Louis, intestinal schistosomiasis, but introduce you to another one, a protozoan parasite, Giardia. Today's setting really takes place in the environments which are characterized by the large lakes in Africa. So here we have a, a view of Lake Albert, and it's along the shoreline I would like to introduce you to the fact that diseases can have their own dynamics and we're not really tackling those environments as best we can with integrated strategies. So when we ask the question, both parasites, Giardia and Schistosomiasis, are incredibly common, and yet when we look at the scientific literature, there isn't a massive amount of crosstalk between the two diseases. So a very cursory example of literature going back from 212 to 215, you can see studies on the epidemiology of control of schistosomiasis dominate. This is not specific to Africa. This might be considered to be a global appraisal. But interestingly, whilst Giardia is, is incredibly cosmopolitan in its distribution across the world, we see fewer studies. But more importantly, we don't see much dialogue between schistosomiasis and Giardia formally. And where we do see that, it's often in clinical case reports. So a child, for example, might have a thorough parasitological screen or a health screen, and therefore they pick up these parasites simultaneously because they have better access to diagnostics and facilities. So I think everyone would agree that within medical parasitology, as a helminthologist, it's often quite difficult to dialogue with the protozoologists and vice versa. And within protozoology, there's a division between the the tissue protists, such as malaria and T. cruzi and leishmaniasis, as well as the, the gut protozoans. But I just want to also show that when we kind of think about trying to bridge the gap between schistosomiasis and uh, giardia, we also have good reasons to explore this uh, commonality because both are waterborne diseases, both are found in impoverished environments, and both of them are able to exacerbate and thrive within poverty conditions. And more importantly, speaking in the Institute of Child's Health, they infect children. You might be surprised to learn that infections such as schistosomiasis in, in Lake Albert can really start at two to three months after the child's birth. And then that child will have a long progression of schistosomiasis until treatments. And at the same time, that child will be picking up jod infections. So I was delighted to see that uh, presentation on, on uh, leprosy. Specifically, there's all these associations put in temporal dynamics. So when you think of who gets infected, when, and why, and the duration of those infections, it's a very unusual environment. So to remind you, the um, schistosomes live inside the vasculature system, large parasites about the size of a grain of rice. The intestinal protozoa, such as uh, giardia, much smaller, live inside the lumen. And when we think of ways in which we can cross this divide, we have some technical difficulties. First of all, even though you can identify both those parasites with fecal microscopy or corposcopy, we use a cat o cats technique for helmets, which is detecting the eggs, but that is unable to detect the giardia. If we move to a, the existing RDTs for schistoma mansoni, we do have a urine-based antigen detection technique. Of course, this doesn't detect um, parasitic protozoa. We have a treatment with praziquantel, and the story in Uganda is really um, mass large-scale mass drug administration of presequantil really started in 2002. So we have a duration of 15 years of MDA along that lakeshore environment. Unusually, schistosomes are, are transmitted by aquatic snails, so that's the thing which ties them to these freshwater environments. And with regard to schistosome mansoni, it's not really known to be zoonotic. So if we contrast with giardia, most people would agree that you'd use formal ether techniques those don't, they, they work well for detection of helmet eggs as well, but we don't really use those in field surveillance. However, there is a good fecal antigen test called Quick Check, which I think is uh, poised to kind of help expand the surveillance of Giardia. And then treatment will be a variety of drugs, but metronidazole is the uh, first line. There's no MDA, so it's often on a case management basis. It contaminates the environment through cysts, and it is, can be uh, zoonotic. So the thing that can bring it to, together these two diseases, of course, diagnostics, and that goes back to the mid-2005, um, when the first uh, experiments with real-time PCR, so advanced examples, you'd have fecal samples in ethanol, you'd amplify them, but you'd be able to use a variety of DNA probes to detect any parasite inside the gut, in addition to bacterial and uh, other viral infections. Just to like to say, we've got colleagues from Leiden here today. 
So the fact that that has been developing over the past year, uh, 10 years has allowed reference laboratories to get a fuller appraisal of the different parasites in that gut environment. But unfortunately, as of yet, there's no point of care technology using DNA-based assays to allow us to co-detect these diseases at the point of contact. There is excitement around RPA, so that's recombinase polymerase um, amplification assays, and I'll talk about that in a second. But that might be the future when we think of point of care technologies bringing together um, giardia and schistosomiasis. So is there a problem in Uganda? Well, if we do a search of the literature, there's a massive literature in Uganda, and just doing a quick search, you can get 345 publications from 1951 onwards. Giardia, not so much, and co-infection surveillance, hardly anything at all. So a recent paper on schistosomiasis has access to mass drug administration and looking at refusals. Interest in Giardia, funny enough, is not from a human side. It's looking at the zoonotic potential of the parasite in animals such as gorillas. And the one which is the, uh, the, the co-surveillance co is actually just a generic review of uh, parasitic di diseases with regard to nutrition. We'll pick that up in a second. Also, an interesting thing, when you think of the widespread nature of Giardia, unlike schistosomiasis, there is a, a global atlas of helmet infections, and here we have the map of uh, schistosomiasis in Uganda. Notice hyperendemic zones around Lake Victoria and, Sh and uh, Lake Albert. Pose the question, do we have a map for Giardia? We don't. So there's actually no information on this parasite at all at a public health level to kind of uh, look at the associations between the two diseases. So that led us to a survey that we were able to complete in June last year. We were surveying at five schools along the, the shoreline. In addition, we're doing snail collecting surveys to look at active transmission of schistosomiasis. And of course, that gives you into close contacts in water. People use water for a variety of different reasons. For schisto, you'll catch it through exposure to contaminated water, but don't forget, forget you'll also catch it through drinking, which is another mode of infection which draws together giardia and schistosomiasis. So using that quick check, we were able to look at um, the schools on the immediate uh, lakeshore, and uh, this is the kind of quick check assay, so you can see if you have a stripe there, there's a positive reaction for giardia. It also co-tests for cryptosporidium. Anyway, the long and the short of it was, when we uh, examined the children for three major parasitic diseases, schistosomiasis, giardiasis, as well as malaria, these children are hyperinfected, and I think there's a bit of a public health shock, to be honest. So in school three, Runga, prevalence today, or last month, 95% of the children have got giardia. That's revealed by PCR, but half of those children have got heavy infections, which you pick up with this clinically relevant RDT. Schistosomiasis, 85%. Malaria, 61%. These are very parasitized children living on the shoreline of Lake Albert. And also, they still have advanced morbidity associated with schistosomiasis. Now, having worked there for a number of years, I'm a little bit um, disappointed that the progress with MDA has not really uh, shown the benefits it might have once promised. So here we have Runga School, which is on the shoreline there in 2003. And then today, Runga School is still impoverished. However, the intensity of infections, I'm afraid to say there hasn't been much change even after 10 years of MDA. So with regard to looking at those associations with heavy giardia and other diseases, well, first off, there's a strong association with uh, blood and stool. Next, there's a strong association with egg patent schisto. So it's probably about a three- to five-fold association of uh, egg patent schistosomiasis and heavy giardiasis. And interestingly... There's a strong association with anemia, and I think this also manifests with other um, impairments such as stunting. So just to point out, it's again along this lakeshore environment where these three diseases are really hyperendemic, so that could be considered to be a, a really tight red line of hyperendemicity of those three diseases. So when you think about the biological plausibilities of of why there's so much giardiasis, because when you go away from the lake, there's still quite a bit, but it's low intensity infections. You might consider the following. If you have a healthy gut, it's able to uh, clear infections, and often giardia can, can be transient, and then it can be cleared. But you might imagine that, as we heard this morning, there's a predominant TH1 response, which is allowed to clear that giardia infection. Having said that, if you have an underlying pathology because of schistosoma mansoni or malaria, malaria, funny enough, actually damages the bowel and will cause um, abrasions, but it also will allow perhaps colonization sites. So here we might have the exit sites of the eggs in red. 
these might be colonized by giardia parasites and then the whole bowel environment is probably skewed towards a TH2. And I think those two things, as you would know, if you have regular parasitic insults to the, um, the surface of the bowel, it will cause malabsorption because the villi become uh, reduced and eventually you'll stop to absorb your food. So things like tropical enteropathies might also lead to a microbiota shift, but that's also resultant because of this generic pathology of schistosomiasis. And then for those of you who don't really kind of uh, know the severity of schistosomiasis, I just want to point out, this is a typical presentation of a child in those environments with hepatosplenic disease, but we often don't visualize the bowel pathology as well as we should. We can use calprotectin as a fecal occult drug. But the reality is if you're able to inspect that bowel, as you might do in experimental schistosomiasis in animals, you'd see this granular martis reactions on the internal surface of the bowel as well as the internal surface. So, of course, we don't do colonoscopies. This environment is too much of a, a resource-intensive setting, but for those who have done colonoscopy with japonicum, you can see internally you have a lot of inflammation and also granulomatous reactions. So it's perhaps very obvious that these sites must be good colonization environments for other parasites. So what next in Uganda? Well, I think I would really advocate that we aren't doing enough to control schistosomiasis, but also we have to think of other ways in which we can have a holistic view of the parasitic diseases in these children. I think the biggest problem we have, we don't have a good point of care test which can co-monitor these diseases. So there might be future application of developing a duplex test for schistosomiasis and giardia combined. That would be very useful for fecal examinations. Of course, if you start to think about access to treatment, no one really knows how to deliver praziquantel with the anti-giardia drugs, and also what regime should you be following, and also what reinfection patterns should we see. So I think the other thing is, once we do establish that, we'll also have to mon monitor the reversal of bowel pathology. So I'm just pointing out that traditionally you have to register children, collect samples, do the diagnostics, and do the treatment. We really have to kind of press that into a much shorter time frame to actually deliver treatments to those who need it. And just to close on a quick plug for Countdown, we're knowing that the future is going to be probably PCR diagnostics, which allows us to expand the vision of gastrointestinal diseases. But I just want to also point out that doing the DNA platform, you can help co-surveillance co of other diseases such as polio. So if polio teams are collecting fecal samples, there's no reason why you shouldn't have access to those to detect STHs such as strongyloides. And another thing which I'm delighted to say people are picking up at the moment is a female genital schistosomiasis. A good way of diagnosing is that through better access to diagnostic PCR from either biopsy or other gynecological samples. So uh, thank you for your attention and just to acknowledge a few colleagues from the schools, London and Liverpool, as well as Imperial College and uh, funding from Difford. Thank you.